Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to discuss research from CyberCX regarding the NTFS USN Journal. Now, before we get started, I'm going to make a few assumptions. First, I'm going to assume that you're already familiar with the USN Journal and with the MFT or Master File Table. You need to understand how both of these artifacts work at least at a high level. Second, I'm going to assume that you understand how to acquire both of these artifacts from a live and running system using something like FTK Imager or CAPE. And third, I'm going to assume that you're comfortable parsing both of these artifacts using Eric Zimmerman's MFTE CMD. If you're unfamiliar with any of these topics, I need you to pause right now and go check the video's description. You'll find links to previous 13 Cubed episodes that cover all of these topics in great detail. Now let's dive into the research from CyberCX. As they point out, the USN Journal unfortunately does not track full file paths. If you've leveraged this artifact in your investigations, I'm sure you'll recognize this as a common pain point. The USN Journal does, however, track the MFT entry and sequence number for each journal entry and its parent. As a quick reminder, in NTFS, the MFT entry number is a unique identifier for each file or directory on the file system. It corresponds to a specific record in the MFT. Each file or directory gets an MFT entry number when it's created. The sequence number, on the other hand, is essentially a version counter associated with an MFT entry. Every time an MFT entry is reused, such as after the deletion of a file, the sequence number is going to increment which helps us identify when the same MFT entry has been repurposed for a new file. Remember, NTFS is always going to prioritize the reuse of existing file records over the creation of new ones. So for example, on a busy system, if you were to shift delete a file to permanently remove it, within seconds, a new file may come along and reuse that previous file's existing MFT file record. So remember, that's just how NTFS works. Now to reconstruct the original full file path for a USN journal entry, most forensic tools are going to cross-reference the MFT entry and sequence number from the USN journal against the actual MFT entry and try to resolve it to the current state of the volume. The challenge here is that the MFT file records originally linked to an entry in the journal may have been reused for a completely different file. In fact, a file record may have been reused multiple times since the original journal entry making it impossible to determine the parent location since that data no longer exists in the MFT. Trust me, I've run into this many times. This is where CyberCX's research offers a game-changing alternative. They propose reading the journal in reverse and tracking stateful information about each entry and its parent as files and directories are created, moved, or deleted. In theory, this approach would allow us to determine all of the paths for every entry in the journal. Let's talk about an example of how this could come in handy. Let's say we have a file called data.zip, originally located in C Users George desktop. The USN journal will log the creation of this file. Then later, let's say the file is moved to C perf logs. And again, that information is logged within the USN journal. Then that file is subsequently deleted. And again, the information is logged in the USN journal. Afterwards, the MFT entry is then reused for a new file called accountspayable.docx located in C Users George Documents. By reading the USN journal in reverse, we can reconstruct the original path for data.zip despite its deletion and despite the fact that the MFT entry has been reused for a completely different file. Pretty cool, right? Well, the even better part of all of this is that CyberCX has released a proof of concept tool that will automate this process. The Python script is going to take as input the CSV output from MFTECMD for both the MFT and the USN journal. The parsed results are then written to a SQLite database, and once the process completes, you'll get a shiny new CSV file with complete path information populated. If you want more technical details, I'll link the original CyberCX article in the video's description below. But for now, let's see some of this in action. We're going to start by manually correlating a USN journal entry against a currently existing file within the MFT. Again, our forensic tools usually automate this process and it's quite easy, but let's start there and then we'll take a look at the CyberCX script and see what it can do for us. 
So let's get started. On my desktop, you'll notice that I have two files, mft.csv and usnjrnl.csv. Off camera, I used Eric Zimmerman's MFTE CMD to parse the MFT, which I wrote out to a file called mft.csv. I did the same thing for $J, which of course is the alternate data stream within $usnjrnl. That's what contains the data that we want to parse within the USN journal. I wrote that output to a file called usnjrnl.csv. I've already opened both of these files within Timeline Explorer, so let me pull that up. You're currently looking at usnjrnl.csv, and in the top right, I've gone ahead and searched for ftk space imager.exe. That's what we're going to use for this portion of the demo. Notice that we have results for the prefetch file for ftk imager, which you can see right here. If you take a look at the update reasons column, you can see the actual reasons or op codes logged within the USN journal. Things like data truncation, data extend, and close. But really, that's not the important part of what I want to show you here. Remember that the USN journal is going to track the MFT entry number and sequence number, which you can see right here, as well as the parent entry number and parent sequence number, which you can see right here. In this case, the entry number is 118224 for the file ftk space imager.exe 6feb3487.pf. Again, that's the prefetch file for ftk imager on this system. This is a currently existing file, it's still on disk. So we should be able to easily correlate this with the MFT to discover the full file path. Of course, we can take an educated guess as to what that would be. It should be C Windows Prefetch, but let's verify that. So remember, 118224 is the value that we want. Let's click on mft.csv right here and notice that within the MFT, we've got the entry number, the sequence number, the parent entry number, and the parent sequence number. So all we're going to do is go over to the entry number and type 118224. And notice when we do so, we can actually see the matching record. And notice that we've got the parent path of Windows Prefetch, which is exactly what we expect. And you can see the file name right here. So this would be an example of how to manually derive the full path based on information within the USN journal. As we said earlier, our forensic tools are typically going to automate this process. The problem becomes, what happens if this MFT file record that we're looking at has since been reused for a completely different file. For example, if we were to shift delete the FTK imager prefetch file, within a few seconds, it's very likely that some other file would come along and use entry number 118224. The sequence number would then increment to 12 instead of 11, but regardless, the original full file path for this prefetch file would be lost and it would simply be replaced with whatever file took its place. This means that we would have no way of determining that original file path, or at least not using this methodology. But what we can do is use the CyberCX tool. So in the next portion of our demo, we're going to use these same two files, mft.csv and usnjrnl.csv, which represent the output of the MFT and USN journal, which were created with MFTECMD, and that's going to be the input that we're going to use for the CyberCX tool. I think you'll be amazed at how easy it is to use this. So let's take a look at that now. Let's begin with a scenario that will hopefully showcase what this tool can do. Notice that once again, we're in Timeline Explorer and we're looking at the parsed output of the USN journal. In the top right, let's search for a file named cl underscore utility ps1. This of course is a PowerShell script and our mission here is to determine the original location of the script. Notice that we have our search results right here for cl underscore utility dot ps1. Let's start with the update reasons column where we can find the op codes for the USN journal operations. We start with a file creation, but notice at the end, we have a file deletion. That means that this file is no longer on disk. So what does that mean regarding the MFT? Well, it means that this file's original MFT file record would have been marked as not in use. In other words, it's available for reuse. The question then becomes, has it been reused? Well, let's find out. We've got an entry number of 60468 and a sequence number of 37. So given that information, let's switch over to mft.csv and in the entry number column, 
let's filter on 60468. Notice that we do have a match, but you'll also notice the sequence number is 39, two greater than what we just saw in the USN journal entry. What does that mean? Well, it means this file record has been reused twice since the original USN journal entry was recorded. And as a result of that, notice this file name is not what we expect. It's mpavdlta.vdm, a completely different file. And that means that this path that you see here is definitely not the path of cl underscore utility.ps1. So how can we determine the original location of this file using this methodology? Well, again, the answer is we can't, but that's where our tool comes into play. So let's go ahead and switch over to Windows Terminal, and now let's take a look at what we can do here. I'm using the Windows Subsystem for Linux, or WSL version 2, with an Ubuntu 22.04 machine. I almost always use WSL2 to run my Python-based forensic tools, and I would highly recommend you do the same. In my opinion, it's much easier to get a Python environment properly set up in WSL2 than it is within Windows. Off camera, I cloned the GitHub repo for this tool, which will be linked in the video's description, and I placed it within my tools directory in a directory named usnjrnl underscore rewind, which is what you're looking at now. If I do a directory listing here, you can see the script at the bottom, and it's called usnjrnl underscore rewind dot py. So that's what we're going to be running. Let's go ahead and run it by typing Python 3 followed by the script, and I'll go ahead and tack on a dash H so that we can see the help and the available options. At the top, you'll see the usage information, and really all we have to do is specify three things. We're going to use a dash M to specify the MFTE CMD output for the parsed MFT. We're going to use a dash U to specify the MFTE CMD output for the parsed USN journal. And remember, we have both of these already done. They're on the desktop. And then lastly, all we have to do is specify the output path. So this is the location to which this tool will write its results. And that's all there is to it. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll press the up arrow and use dash M and we'll point to mount C users, my user, desktop, mft.csv. Then we'll use dash U and point to mount C users, my user, desktop, usnjrnl.csv. And then lastly, all we have to do is specify the output path, which will be the same path of C, users, my user, desktop. And that's all there is to it. So once I press enter, notice that it's going through and actually creating the SQLite database, adding the data to the database, and then it will begin to rewind the journal. Now this process can take several minutes to complete, so let's come back when it's done and take a look at the results. All right, as you can see, that took a little over three minutes to complete, and now we should have our output on the desktop. So let's check it out. If I minimize this, notice that we have the ntfs.sqlite file. So that's the SQLite database that it created. And then you'll see usnjrnl.fullpaths.csv, which of course is the file in which we're interested. Now I already have Timeline Explorer open, so let's just pull that up and we'll go up to file and we'll choose open and then we'll just point to that file right here. And that's going to open it up in a third tab. And here we go. Notice that we have line, tag, update, timestamp, parent, path, name, extension, entry number, sequence number, parent entry number, parent sequence number, update sequence number. And of course, if we scroll to the right, we can see some additional columns here as well, including the update reasons and the file attributes along with the source file. And really that's all there is to it. The main column of interest here is of course going to be parent path. But now the question is, is that file that we looked at earlier present here? So you know what we're going to do next. We'll go up to the top right and type in cl underscore utility dot ps1 and see what we can find out. So let's give that just a second to return the results. And as you can see, we do indeed have matches right here and check this out. Windows temp s diag followed by this GUID. So that is the parent path of cl underscore utility dot ps1. The parent path that we were unable to determine using the previous method, but through rewinding the journal, well, there it is. So I think that's a great example of how powerful this tool is and really this methodology that they're using to compute the parent paths. I hope you found this information useful and I hope you'll consider using this utility in your investigations. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider doing so as I would greatly appreciate it. 
And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next 13 Cubed episode.